Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Facebook friends. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. Yes. All that you have done and all that you will do. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy yes, Lord. and your love. Mm -hmm. We thank you for waking us up this morning, Lord. Yes. Yes. Allowing us to come into your sanctuary. Amen. to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yes. Mm -hmm. A man who I have a dream to see is embedded in the hearts and minds of many yes. still today. Amen. A man whose goal was to raise public awareness of racism, mm -hmm. to end segregation, mm -hmm. to, and here in the United States, Father, we thank you for making us strong. Yes. Strong enough to endure all horrors of slavery and incarceration, Amen. murder, violence, police brutality, yes. and the many obstacles of oppression. Yes, we still fight mm -hmm. for justice and equality as we can still remember the song sang by Dr. Martin Luther King, We Shall Overcome One Day. I pray, Lord, that this world repents Amen. so that the gates of heaven open wider and the gates of hell close for eternity where there will be peace on earth, goodwill towards men, women, and children. Yes. This is my prayer, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
and matters of racism and prejudice. And along the way, there has been so much personal discovery, enlightenment, and awareness as we face head on these ugly realities. We've cried together and we've laughed together. We've eaten together and then we've eaten some more together. What I'm most proud of is how we have grown together in understanding, in relationship, and as the beloved community, Dr. King envisioned. The pandemic forced us to make some changes, but many remain committed to the cause. And for that, I am grateful. This letter from a Birmingham jail is the first document we read together as a way to begin our conversations. And so we return to it today, sort of as a guiding light as we continue to fight the good fight. At this time, we will receive a greeting from Father Phil. Let's say amen for Father Phil. Amen. Greeting to members of non olive Missionary Baptist Church, greeting and those who are joining us during the live streaming of this event. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege uh, to continue our working relationship with my brother, Pastor Howard, the members of Mount Olive, members of St. Paul and uh, South Press and those who have been participating for the past two and a half years and helping. And it's never too late uh, for you, for those who are viewing for the first time today, to join us in our time of conversation. And uh, twice a month, uh, on the second and fourth Tuesdays, we uh, study the book. Uh, and you are joining you are invited to join us. Uh, this is not what we were hoping for, but we're in COVID time. Uh, unfortunately, it would have been an honor to have the Martin Luther King Jr. celebration here at Mount Olive, uh, as it was a year ago at St. Paul when Pastor Father Howard preached. I, uh, it's better late than never. But I finally gave him a picture that was taken uh, when he was preaching in the pulpit of St. Paul, and uh, you will see that it is a very unique picture. Uh, so take time, I'm sure Pastor Howard will share that with you. Uh, so again, it's an honor to be here, and God's blessing on our conversations and our listening and, and our actions moving forward today in these uh, difficult and challenging days. God bless you. Amen. God bless you, Father Phil, and I am appreciative of that working relationship that, again, neither one of us saw coming, but we have become quite acquainted with one another, and uh, we appreciate his friendship, his brotherhood, and the partnership that we have experienced at this time. I wanted to have a, just a little song before we jump into this letter. And so, a Negro spiritual, as we reflect upon Dr. King and this day. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home, swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. I looked over Jordan, what did I see? 
peacefully protesting the poor treatment of black folks in Birmingham. I think today we run by the title of this letter so quickly and generically that we may not feel the sting of that reality. He never deserved to be there in the first place. And if that's not enough, he's being criticized by a group of white ministers who are totally outside of what King experiences as a black man in America. As King will point out later in the letter, white people are needed in the fight for fairness, equality, and justice. But their engagement must be from a place of listening to learn from those who are the victims of racism and not from a place of criticism that comes from the group that victimizes. And even though this clergy group was critical of Dr. King, he found them to be sincere. And so we have this letter as his response. I think I can indicate why I am here in Birmingham, since few have been influenced by the views which argue against outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every southern state, with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliated organizations across the South, and one of them is the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Frequently, we share staff, educational, and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, the affiliate here in Birmingham asked us to be on call to engage in a non-violent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented and when the hour came, we lived up to that to our promise. So I, along with several members of my staff, am here because I was invited here. I am here because I have organizational ties here. In reflecting upon uh, Dr. King's letter, in response to a one-page letter by so-called liberal white clergy, I wonder if in 2021, how many, quote, white liberal clergy would ascribe their name to their letter if it was written today, and then if Dr. King was with us today. Um, Dr. King, Dr. King, oh, can you hear me well? That's better. Sorry, folks. Um, Dr. King's letter is 12 pages long, written in a cell in a jail that is uh, beyond diplomatic and pointed in addressing the so-called concerns uh, and misguided directions of the white clergy who obviously weren't getting things. And so Dr. King's entire letter uh, said the great fight uh, 58 years later uh, still made some progress, but frankly the past four years uh, we have regressed considerably um, and that will change in 46 hours. Uh, our work will only begin, and it will be difficult, uh, because we are dealing uh, with a great evil, and some have done it in the name of God, with um, impurity, maybe that that's not trying to say that it is at all. But more basically, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century BC 
left their villages and carried their, thus saith the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns. And just as the Apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the great old Roman world, so am I prepared to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. You deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I am sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the condition that brought about the demonstrations. I'm sure that none of you want to rest content with the superficial kind of social analysis that deals merely with effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. It is unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham. But it is even more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left the Negro community with no alternative. My reaction. So not only is he in jail, but he's in Birmingham because injustice is there. Theologically and as a minister, I couldn't help but think that Jesus was on earth for a similar reason. Sin was here. And I think it's important for us to always keep in mind that King very much anchored his fight for justice in scripture with love and the push for a beloved community as the motivation. And he saw himself as carrying the gospel. And that makes sense because he was a preacher. But I would like to ask this rhetorical question. What are you carrying in this fight for justice? Is it love or hate? Hope or despair? A desire to be active or passive? What do you carry in this fight? This statement, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, is a classic line quoted all over the world, I'm sure. But the following line is so universally true, yet so universally ignored. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. That line about our interrelatedness, our interdependence, our connection to one another cannot be better illustrated today than through the visible presence of face masks being worn everywhere and all over the world as proof that we must stand together and fight together if we all expect to survive. The coronavirus has put billions of people on the same page and in the same fight. If only we would treat the virus of racism the same way. 
Lastly, I think we all do well to keep in mind with respect to peaceful protests or even riots, which Dr. King would call elsewhere the language of the unheard. That people don't just wake up and decide to organize and protest or even riot for no reason. There are pre-existing conditions that encourage such reaction. And I believe Dr. King is saying that if there would be as much outrage and outcry and criticism from the privileged class against those pre-existing conditions like what? Like predatory living practices in the black community, like unfair housing practices, inequality in education, poor access to adequate food supplies and health care, the injustices of the so-called justice system, just to name a few. If there would be as much outrage and outcry on those things as there is around the symptomatic protests and riots, then there might be less demonstrations to contend with altogether. Dr. King continues, then we ask that you have received the opportunity to talk to the leader of the Birmingham economic community in the course of the negotiations. Certain promises were made by the merchants. For example, to remove the store's humiliating racial signs. On the basis of these promises, the residents read some of the words, and the leaders of the Alabama Christian movement for human rights agreed to a moratorium on all demonstrations. As the weeks and months went by, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. A few times, briefly removed, returned, the others remained. What jumps off the page of Dr. King's letter for me is the issue, an historical issue, that is relevant as of a minute ago, is the broken promises that white people have made and have not followed through on, uh, despite their denials that they think they did. These broken promises. And Dr. King called that on the pepper. Uh, part of uh, white folks' problem is they see the uh, results, but do not have the uh, energy or the interest to dig deeper is to see the patterns, the underlying historical patterns uh, in the mindset of white people uh, that have been apparent for decades, actually centuries for that yeah. matter. One of the basic points in your statement is that the action that I and my associates have been taking in Birmingham is untimely. Some have asked, why didn't you give the new city administration time to act? The only answer that I can give to this query is that the new Birmingham administration must be prodded about as much as the outgoing one before it will act. We are sadly mistaken if we feel that the election of Albert Boutwell as mayor will bring the millennium to Birmingham. While Mr. Boutwell is as much, is as much more gentle person than Mr. Connor, they are both segregationists dedicated to maintenance of the status quo. I have hope that Mr. Boutwell will be reasonable enough to see the futility of massive resistance to desegregation. But he will not see this without pressure from devotees of civil rights. My friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent pressure. Lamentably, 
It is an historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture. But as Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups tend to be more immoral than individuals. Dr. King continues, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always been never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. Lord have mercy, did we see that in indisputable graphic ways on January 6th in yeah. Washington, D.C. Yeah. Graphically, indisputably, and grossly uh, viewed that white people need to really open their hearts and minds to see. Um, and there is a growing um, number of white people who are getting it. Uh, that's one of the blessings that God has given us in the organ organic evolution of our courageous conversation. As, as Pastor Howard said, it, it has been amazing and gratifying and challenging for all um, to experience what we have in the past two and a half years of where we are and where we need to continue to be. Uh, and it's not easy. God never promised that it was easy. No, sir. And Dr. King uh, continues to challenge all of us uh, to stay focused. We have waited for more than 340 years. Now that's when he wrote 58 years ago. So let me change that number and start again. We have waited for more than 398 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence but we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will, and drown your sisters and brothers at whim. When you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill our black brothers and sisters. When you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society. When you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park 
that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-county drive, and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never given the respected title Mrs. When you are harried by day and haunted by night, by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. My reaction. Status quo is sometimes as much of a virus as is COVID-19. And if we could have the same urgency around vaccination for prejudice, bigotry, bias, and racism that we had with Pfizer and Moderna, then the humanity of black and brown people would be preserved and our God-given dignity would be acknowledged. Nobody has been saying wait for the vaccination, but rather everyone has been saying hurry up. What I think many white people fail to understand about the impact of the prejudicial imbalance in society, uh, the psychological impact and the emotional impact is what Dr. King articulated so well in talking about his children. And part of why white people fail to see it is because though it is intangible, right, you can't touch it, it's not invisible to those who can see well. Of course we can see the disparities in employment, housing, and the judicial system, but it's harder to detect the diminishing value of your self-esteem it's harder to detect 
the diminishing and debilitating view of your self-worth. And it's hard to detect the diminishing, debilitating, demoralizing picture of your own personhood. One can only imagine what it must feel like for a father to see his daughter begin to adopt, begin to take on a sense of inferiority, a sense of nobodiness, and then subsequently a sense of unconscious bitterness toward white people, simply because their skin color won't allow them to go, ironically, to fun time, restricted from fun. Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, in his The Souls of Black Folk, said it this way, that white people sometimes act like they want to ask us, what does it feel like to be a problem? And that's what many in the dominant class do not see and cannot understand. Even with all of the self-worth Dr. Du Bois could have felt as the first African American to graduate from Harvard University with a PhD in 1895. And even with all of the self-esteem Dr. King may have had, after earning his PhD from Boston University, in spite of it all, they both were still well acquainted with the fact that the white world still saw them as, treated them as, and handled them as a boy, as a nigga, and or even as a thing even as a thing. I, I like Du Bois' question, what does it feel like to be a problem? But I also see the question, Father Phil, as what does it feel like to be a thing? This is why I love that one of my professors said, and you all in the group, Courageous Conversations have heard me say it before, but one of my seminary professors said one of the most humane and dignifying things one person can do for another person is to actually see them. To see their humanity, to see their fullness, and to see the adequacy of their substance. To see the adequacy of their substance right now and not later. That's the urgency of the moment. And that's where the fight for equality begins. Bishop Desmond Tutu said it like this, and I'll end my comments here. The only solution to South Africa's crisis is for whites to accept blacks as human beings. I am going to take the liberty of commenting on this section that Pastor Howard read. In preparation uh, for our celebration, we were working through this uh, under Dr. King's, and when we were divvying up the, the passages that we felt that we should uh, share today, I have to confess that I did not want to read this section uh, of Dr. King's letter. Uh, the, for the sole purpose is I have never, ever used, said the N-word. And I wasn't about to do that today. Um, uh, I'm talking to the white folk now, specifically, that this section of Dr. King's letter, we have never, ever experienced this. We have perpetrated that on people of color. 
not only African Americans, but other people. We've had that negative history. Racism is our historical sin as Americans. And I want us to be all attentive because when I begin, we're going to say, oh, yeah, I know that verse in the Gospel of Matthew. But there's a section in this verse, uh, this section of the reading in Matthew's Gospel, that I'm going to stress hardcore. And it comes from Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall. That's not a suggestion. That is a command. You shall love, your, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall, not a suggestion, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And here's the clincher. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We focus on the Ten Commandments. Those were not suggestions. The first three deal with our relationship with God, and the remaining commandments deal with our relationship with each other, no matter who they are. That was part of God's plan, and sinful human beings blew it. And we're blowing it every day. And that's why we need to ask for forgiveness, especially white people. Especially white people. I uh, am uh, reminded of Dr. King's quote that I'm going to share with you because of what happened last Wednesday on January 6th when we uh, celebrated the Epiphany of our Lord, the 12th day of Christmas the visiting of Magi. Quote, Dr. King, returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate multiplies hate, Violence multiplies violence, and toughness multiplies toughness in the descending spiral of destruction. So when Jesus says, love your enemies, he is setting forth a profound and ultimately inescapable admonition. Look that up in Oxford Dictionary. Have we not come to such an impasse in the modern world that we must love our enemies or else? The chain reaction of evil hate begetting hate, wars producing wars, must be broken. Or we shall be plunged into the dark abyss of annihilation. Close quote. Dr. King, you express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1934 outlawing segregation in public schools. At first glance, it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. 
I would be the first to advocate a more obeying just laws. One has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. It, it, it's impossible to read Dr. Letter, Dr. King's letter in the eyes of 2021, which is only 15 days old. Only 18 days. Dr. King's question, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? Huh? November, uh, January 6th. Yeah. Um, Dr. King ends in this section, I would agree that agree with St. Augustine that unjust law is no law at all. Of course, there is nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was evidenced sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar on the ground that a higher moral law was at stake. It was practiced superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions and the excruciating pain of chopping blocks rather than submit to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. In our own nation, the Boston Tea Party represented a massive act of civil disobedience. We should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal. And everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I am sure that had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. If today I lived in a communist country, where certain principles dear to the Christian faith are suppressed, I would openly advocate disobeying that country's anti-religious laws. Four and a half years ago, a good friend of mine uh, shared a true story with me that his friend was visiting his grandmother, two grandsons actually, and uh, she had the TV on in the living room, and they walked in, and uh, you know who was on TV. Um, and uh, at some point, the two grandsons asked their grandmother, oh, Grandma, what do you think? because she did not respond right away. When she did respond, after a pregnant pause, was, that's how it all started. She was a Holocaust survivor. That was four and a half years ago. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I've been gravely disappointed 
with the white moderate. I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action. Who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. Who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding I know I just talked about the dangers of shallow water yesterday. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Last of my reactions. There is reason, there is a reason, there is a reason why you don't ever see large groups of black people parading up and down streets with American flags and crying at ball games at the singing of the national anthem. And there is a reason why Colin Kaepernick and others would take a knee. Uh -huh. It is because of the profound and pervasive disconnect that we feel between what this nation has promised and what this nation has practiced. We are not out to disrespect the flag or the song, but we are trying to highlight how disrespectful it is for white people to hypocritically hold up these American faced lie uh -huh. on the status quo don't stand up for the flag yeah. if you're going to sit down on the frustrated freedoms of black and brown people yeah. don't continue to weigh these American symbols as honorable truth in the face of a dishonorable lie. Of course, I do not speak for every person of color in this country, but I do believe, as did Dr. King, that the white moderate who is okay with so-called order and okay with things as they are, have to be enlisted in the fight if change is to come. And while their voice, their voice, the voice of the white moderate is important in the struggle, they have to be careful to not control or mute the authentic expression of our voice. In the spirit of the Hebrew boys who resisted the king, if we want to resist by taking a knee, let us take a knee. If we want to resist by marching, let us march. If we want to re 
resist by holding a rally, then for God's sake, let us hold a rally. So long as nobody is being physically hurt and property is not damaged, white people and white moderates should support our resistance and not critique it. Amen. As a white, privileged male and Christian, I too um, believe that I cannot support a rally um, until it radically changes. Uh, and not only talks the talk, but walks the walk in the 21st century and beyond. We have uh, three uh, questions uh, for dialogue, and those who are uh, with us via live streaming, you can uh, type your answers, or if you have any questions, or those who are here present in Town Hall uh, can have a question or want to share a comment. Um, Please do. But the first question for our dialogue is what from Dr. King's letter in your hearing today and in light of the current realities in our country stand out for you? What from Dr. King's letter in your hearing today and in light of the current realities in our country stand out for you? Anyone here present? Not much has changed. We're still fighting the same cause. Any questions you can type, David? Or comments? Your mic up to your mouth. One comment that was made is uh, uh, what Father Phil is saying is that the uh, Catholic and Protestant churches went along with Hitler until he turned on them too. And then it was too late. We must be vigilant. Oh, I have talked about that and preached about that often nowadays. I agree that that isn't much that has changed when we read the letter, but something that stands out to me presently is uh, when he talks about policemen killing our brothers and our sisters. The reality of the George Floyds and the Breonna Taylors and this long, endless list, when you read something like that, when they were in the heat of the civil rights movement. And here we are in the 21st century in 2021, and it seems that we have made very little progress, if any, at all. So that's something that stands out to me today. But the other part is that stands out now in hearing it today, the letter today, is that since last Wednesday, there has been great light shine in the darkness area uh, for me as a privileged white person to see uh, and with, your, with my own eyes and hear with my own ears uh, that uh, the pattern of racism is deep. Hello. What's happening now before Wednesday, the inauguration of President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, is that 25,000 National Guard members yeah. are going through a background check they do periodically do background checks, but to do so before the inauguration of a president is unprecedented. Uh, white folk, take note. Why would that have to be done? Dig deep. Open your hearts and your minds and your eyes and 
see the mother sent them. Any questions, comments? Anybody else? Let's go to the second question. What surprises or shocked you from your hearing these portions of Dr. King's letter 58 years later? What surprises or shocked you from your hearing these portions of Dr. King's letter 58 years later? Nothing really.
step back in my truck. Or I could get down to the bottom of the hill and get a call again. My kidney could go back up there. So I go back up there, I ring the doorbell. He said, oh, uh, since I can't get nobody else, you know, I guess you'll have to do. I kind of, you know, at that age, I kind of bit my tongue a little bit because I could have said a lot of other things to him. I said, well, sir, okay. He said, but you can't come through my house. You got to go around to the back. I open the gate and let you through. So I went around to the back. I told this guy, I said, uh, sir, I got to go in because the, maybe you need a break there. So when we get there to the back door, he said, oh, you can come in through my back door. And you go down these steps, and that's far as you go. He took me down, showed me the breaker box and stuff. But he stood right there and watched me, like I was going to take something or something like that. To make a long story short, I felt degraded, but I had to do a job. But here's the whole thing. We as black men, and I'm quite sure my pastor can agree with this, we get treated real rough, I'll just say rough, as we did back then. But they do it in a different is an important one, and 
listening to another person instead of jumping in and interrupting each other, which we all have a book, because we're processing our response while another person is talking as opposed to listening to the person and then responding. So we all need to work on that, but white people need to unlearn and learn the patterns of racism and uh, take a hard look. I mean, last, the new videotape of what happened in Washington, D.C., I said, Lord have mercy, that's not Jesus at all. Uh, you need a big two by four uh, in your behind. Um, in praying in the Senate the way they did, and the image of a noose in the Capitol, and what really, really made me almost throw up uh, was two white people reenacting the murder of George Floyd. That really irritated the heck out of me. But I did notice that that was not stressed in the media. The noose was, but not two white people reenacting the eight minute and 46 second knee. Have they? Yeah, they've been doing, oh, well that's the first time I've seen that. So that's not good. But as a white person of privilege, we need to speak out louder, calmer, in a Christ-like manner. In other words, to take a non-violent approach. Um, we, as human beings, white, black, Hispanic, Oriental, but as human beings, we have a tendency to react. And that comes from a part of our brain, the reptilian part of our brain, and the sole purpose of the reptilian part of the brain is to attack. What we need to do is respond. And Dr. King emphasizes and Walt was all about non-violent responses. Uh, but I understand the anger and the frustration because it's gone way, 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 way too long. And one of the other blessings of COVID time, believe it or not, is that people were supposed to be staying at home and they were watching TV and they saw that repeatedly. And I think that really was a two by four to white people to see it and in a way experience it, that it is a reality perpetrated on people of color. Unfortunately, a lot of our white brothers and sisters who are or claim to be Christians have a very distorted and perverted view of what Christianity is, or rather even what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Uh, we have to always keep in mind that there were so-called Christians who enslaved black folks here in America. And they would use the scripture to push their own agenda and those of us who have a better understanding and interpretation of what thus saith the Lord, we understand the folly of their view. And so they put their Bibles with their flags, with their guns, and they Always hearing but never learning. Always looking but never really seeing. And we just have to stand fortified against them and to push back on the darkness which the, with the light that we know is the light of Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for your comments 
and for your engagement, and we are going to just follow one more or two points of order. Let's just check in to see if there's oh, anything. Okay. Were there any questions or comments online on the Facebook group? Well, there was one comment that just came in. It says, courageous conversations has opened my eyes to the feelings of people of color and ways in which white privilege have dominated their lives. I urge all of you to join us and become part of this beloved community. It is such a positive movement and is making a, dis a difference in the lives of those participating. D David, can you please read that one more time? You did good with that, but I really want people to hear that. I know that there are some people that I try to encourage to be involved and they don't appreciate the meaning or the value of why, uh, why do you want us to go down these horrible memory lanes for us with white people? They already know what the problems are. They already know they are wrong. They already know how racism works. This is some of what I hear, unfortunately, against people of color in my context. And I have heard this kind of sentiment that you just stated from someone multiple times in our meetings to help me know that there is a lot that white people don't know. And there is a lot that white people don't understand, but it's been because of these conversations and because of these dialogues, there's so much enlightenment and education and even transformation has taken place. So if you don't mind, if you could read that again uh, as well as you do so that we can all hear this and take it in, and I presume it's from a white person. Yes. Courageous conversations. Courageous Conversations has opened my eyes to the feelings of people of color and ways in which white privilege have dominated their lives. I urge all of you to join us and become part of this beloved community. It is such a positive movement and is making a difference in the lives of those participating. Thank you. And I'd just like to say that, at least from my uh, growth and understanding and people who have been attending the Courageous Conversations and the Social Justice Book Group is, I understand and appreciate uh, the hesitation and the doubt uh, of you as African Americans because it's exhausting, ugly, exhausting. And as Dr. King repeats in his letter, uh, absolutely tired of broken promises. And we need to re learn how to keep our promises um, to Almighty God and to all human beings. Yes, I was just going to get to that. I had another comment that came in after that. How disgusting of our country that a person should ever have to say or even think, I am not an animal, so don't treat me like one. We are morally depraved, even those of us who don't think this way about people of color, because we have not done enough. sitting by quietly and 
and saying that's not right, but at least people are starting to speak up, speak up and speak out. And of course, before the pandemic, we were moving in that direction of action items. It had, it had not been our aspiration to just stop with talking. We wanted to move into some action and I imagine that we will again get back to trying to organize and plan and strategize and figure out things that we can do together to make some changes in this city and in this area. But at, at first I think it's good to be able to internally recognize some of these problems that we have within and then to be able to articulate them, to be able to express them outwardly and publicly in an effort to try to have some honest transparency. That's the only way that we can really grow and discover and move forward together. Wear your masks, keep social distancing, and we can get back to where we were. Um, and it's courageous conversation. And I do believe in my heart, pun intended, uh, that what we've been doing and what we have been doing and what we will continue to do is positive. Yeah. It's genuinely and authentically, I love that word, look that up in the dictionary. Authentically, I'm a big fan of looking up words in the dictionary. It's a, it's a learning experience because we use words but we don't really understand the full meaning of the words that we use. Uh, but it's been authentic, uh, positive change and we are supposed to be change agents uh, today as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us uh, pray uh, through uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, litany for 2021. In every era, God has chosen men and women to serve the needs of his people. Such a servant was Martin Luther King Jr., whose birth we celebrated. We are deeply thankful for the life of this 20, 20th century prophet. May the wisdom and words of Martin Luther King rekindle our faith. May the deep love that Dr. King had for all people be released in us, that we too might work miracles in the lives of those who continue to hate. Dr. King taught that only love can overcome hatred, bitterness, and fear. May his struggle for social transformation continue in this generation. May all people come to believe that with perseverance we shall overcome. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, Amos 5, 24. May the work of Dr. King continue to eradicate racial injustice and its ungodly consequences. Dr. King pursued his dream for racial equality by appealing to the conscience of his enemies. May we continue to cultivate the nonviolent discipline of Dr. King, abandoning unrestrained acts of force. He taught us that a heart full of grace and love is just as important as an education. May the spirit of Dr. King continue to flow through our daily living. He believed in self-respect and dignity even though he knew that there would be difficult days ahead. May we have the courage of Dr. King as we continue to stand up for justice, reconciliation, and truth, despite challenge and controversy. Dr. King said that war is never a victory, regardless of the outcome. May the peace of the risen Christ cause the fury of war to vanish from the face of the earth. 
Dr. King went to the mountaintop. He saw the promised land, and he reassured us that we will get there one day. God of glory, be with us on the journey. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. We're going to prepare to close out with a benediction and we're going to sing together and you all at home on Facebook can sing with us as well. We shall overcome someday. Let us pray. Most holy and righteous God, we thank you today for your grace and mercy and for this wonderful opportunity to come together as one people. We remember Dr. King today, one of your foremost ambassadors for freedom, equality, and justice in recent history. We are forever indebted to him, his life, his legacy, his stance, his courage, and his faith. As he put into action what he knew to be true in his heart. We pray now, Lord, that you would excite us and move us in the way that he and so many other freedom fighters were moved. That we might become more uncomfortable each day with the status quo. Encourage us, embolden us, and fortify us with your spirit that we might rest not on our laurels, but in knowing that a person who won't stand for something will fall for anything. Protect us and keep us as only you can. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday, oh deep in my heart.